Are we? We're on. Hello. I've only met you. I've been seeing your name in publications for many, many, many years. Um, but also it shows that I couldn't hear what was said in the first part. Okay. Just can you ask this guy here, Lance? Oh, okay. Yep. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. There's still stragglers coming in. They're all going to get in trouble later. And they won't get their um, afternoon tea given to them. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming back. If you would like to get a copy of the full program, it is on the ANS big website, but you can also just scan this QR code to get a copy of the full program so you know what's coming up. And what is coming up is the next session is primarily uh, is uses of biochar, but and, and the first two speakers are focusing on the agricultural applications, and then a third speaker is focusing on the built environment, and then we go on to other amazing uses of biochar after lunch. Um, so I would really love to um, welcome and thank uh, Lynn McDonald for everything, Dr. Lynn McDonald from CSIRO for everything that she does in the biochar space as well. And she's very instrumental here on the campus, along with Eshan, who's speaking later this morning after Lynn, uh, Lynn as well. Um, and um, advancing that biochar space in, uh, in the research side. So, Lynn is um, a, she's going to talk about uh, agricultural applications and uses of biochar. Um, and she's involved in sustainable agriculture. She's a research scientist at CSIRO. She's been there for 15 years, specialising in low emissions agriculture, soil carbon, and indicators of soil health and participatory research for New World Impact. So biochar is very important and the forefront of her work. So thank you, Lynn, if you'd like to make your way out onto stage and um, let's welcome Lynn, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I'm a bit of a wanderer at times, so I'm actually gonna take this out of its stand. Um, and yeah, I really do appreciate the, the invitation um, to come along and talk today. Um, I've had a long journey with biochar. Um, started 10 years ago looking at the application of biochar into soils as an agricultural amendment. Um, but I think our, our journey and our story from then has come a long way. Um, I'm here today representing CSIRO's Towards Net Zero Mission. Um, which is a large program of work that's helping the hard to abate sectors uh, decarbonise. Um, and my role there is looking at agriculture as a hard to abate um, sector. It's often targeted because of those emissions associated with agriculture, but I think we also have to be real. Agricultural production is always going to produce emissions. By changing our landscape um, and the way we manage the systems, we can reduce those emissions. But I think we're looking towards low emissions intensity agriculture within net zero regions, which is a slightly different pitch towards everything being net zero. Um, so the simple story, where we started over 10 years ago with biochar, is that we have available biomass crop um, wastes or the likes that can be used in pyrolysis to produce energy and biochar. And after that, there's a great opportunity to pop it into soil, to improve plant productivity and to improve the condition of our soils. Australia has had a long history in some really foundational research over those 10 years, which has demonstrated the permanence of biochar in soil. Now, we might argue about how permanent that really is, but it's over 500 years. So the reality is, as an organic resource or an organic amendment, it's more stable than some of the other forms that are available. We know and talk a lot about how the behaviours of biochar differ, depending on how, what feedstock was used to produce it and the technology or technology conditions that were used um, to produce it. And that often causes a lot, of, um, a lot of confusion in the space because not all biochars are the same. 
but that is also an opportunity around what we can use it for. To me, the most interesting aspect of biochar are those surfaces. They've got very interesting surface reactivity where things can stick to it, not permanently. They can be um, desorbed as well. And it also has the catalytic type behaviors um, that, that increase um, reactions, whether that be in soil um, or in the guts of our animals. But as a soil amendment, there's a huge volume um, of research out there that demonstrates that biochar can have physical, chemical, and biological impacts on our soils, which bring benefits to the condition of soil and can improve plant growth. But it, it's also um, produced this, uh, an environment where the expectations of what biochar can achieve are huge. Um, and I think, you know, it's really important to remember that biochar is not a silver bullet for all situations. To successfully navigate what biochar can be used for, targeted use is important. And that goes for not just targeted use within the soil, understanding what is constraining plant growth and productivity, if that's what we want to improve, but it's also true for any other applications um, that we might want to target. So this simple story um, of biochar, I would argue, is outdated. There are techno-economic challenges that have hampered both adoption and scaling. And we need to update um, some of our thinking around biochar away from that simple linear approach towards one of value add and circularity. The real opportunity here is how we tie together resource management, bioenergy, and carbon-enhanced products. And that means we need to update that simplistic viewpoint. We're not producing biochar simply to put it into soils. In fact, if we're doing that, we're missing valuable opportunities. Um, and that's, I guess, what I want to talk about today in the context of our agricultural applications. Um, so really, I've updated that simplistic diagram here to really start thinking around what are our resources and do we put them directly into bioenergy production or pyrolysis systems or can we gain value before we put those materials into pyrolysis or bio bioenergy? Um, many of these um, biomass resources have bioactives associated with them. So there's a shift in the thinking externally, more towards biorefinery type approaches, where we can harness those bioactives, which typically have high value, um, prior to pyrolysis, and use the remaining lignocellulose material to fuel the bioenergy and produce biochar, which can then go in to produce carbon-enhanced products carbon-enhanced fertilizers in combination um, with composting or the likes to create new industries, new low-carbon industries with multiple points of value add. So the point of this diagram is really to, to emphasize that unlocking the full potential of biochar as a nature-based carbon capture technology requires regional matching of those suitable biomass waste um, feedstocks with value add opportunities that target high value markets. Um, just a reminder, I guess, for me, um, that the starting point in this discussion is not where we're going to apply that biochar, um, and particularly um, into soil application, but the discussion and the thinking actually starts at the beginning what are those biomass resources that are available to the South Australia region to drive these low carbon um, industries? And the end point is our net zero regions that have diverse opportunities and um, prosperous communities. So um, I tend to talk about pyrolysis biochar systems, and that's for a very good reason. I like to emphasize 
that it's not biochar alone, but it's intimately tied to our bioenergy processes. And we can't really disentangle these if we want to scale um, and enable adoption at, um, at, a, at a scale that's going to have impact on our climate challenges. Um, CSIRO has done a lot of work um, around Australia's carbon sequestration potential um, in recent years, hand in hand with the Climate Change Authority. And there's a series of reports out around Australia's carbon sequestration potential. It puts pyrolysis biochar systems in context of our broader systems and of our broader um, carbon sequestration technologies or potential. And biochar for me sits in a very special place. Of the nature-based solutions available to us, biochar has the highest permanence by far. It's more permanent than our plantations, than our soil carbon, um, and our other nature-based solutions. But of those engineering technologies, technologies, which Annette outlined rather well, our BECs and our um, other carbon, air carbon capture and all these um, engineered solutions, pyrolysis as a technology has the most mature technological readiness level in order to scale. So here we have a solution that is, is using plant capture um, as one of the most efficient ways of capturing carbon um, in, in our systems, um, along with technology that's ready to be capturing um, and storing over the long term. Um, just to highlight that that report does co cover some of the um, barriers, risks, co-benefits and enablers around biochar. And when you start comparing them to other technologies, it really does set pyrolysis biochar systems in a place that's ready to scale. Um, so leaning on some of the South Australia context here, um, I do believe that context, context, context is really important when it comes to pyrolysis biochar systems. Um, and this morning, Martin outlined some of those South Australian targets. South Australian government has set um, ambitious targets and it's achieving them. I'm really pleased to see um, the new renewable energy legislation, the biodiversity legislation, and the strong direction setting that they have um, around carbon farming and net zero. They are also explicitly tying resource management um, with carbon capture. So they have a, a net zero initiative um, which looks at net zero, uh, zero waste um, and zero carbon. So today I think that you know, our real questions when we think that we are here in South Australia and we're talking about their um, pathway forward towards lowering emissions, what are those place-based opportunities for pyrolysis biochar systems in South Australian agriculture. Our agricultural systems here are quite different um, to the East Coast. There's a lot of water limited um, systems and we need to think about where that biomass is going to come from and how we're gonna best effectively use it. We also need to think about what value um, can new low carbon industries be, um, bring to South Australia and how we enable that scaling and adoption um, for best effect. Agricultural applications. Now, the traditional view um, is that biochar is a soil amendment. We can put it into our um, agricultural systems and improve plant productivity. Um, I'm reasonably vocal um, around that being an outdated view. I think it's a missed opportunity in some sense to view biochar as an amendment by itself. I think when we get creative around how we integrate that biochar with other things, then we get into the interesting areas where we can really tie together ecological improvement with our agricultural systems. Um, so one, one um, active area at the moment is how we use biochar in combination with other organic amendments, whether that's with compost, if we add it to our composting systems, 
we can actually bring um, efficiencies in that compost, so less emissions of greenhouse gas in the composting process. We capture those nutrients on those sticky surfaces of the biochar so that we've got more available nutrition when the compost goes in. Um, and we have technologies to pelletalize that or granulate it so that we're not thinking about surface application anymore where it's prone to wind or water erosion. We are getting it into the soil where it works and where it, um, where it works most effectively. So if we think about granulation, there's a lot of work with um, South Australian industries, um, particularly amendments companies, around how to granulate that so that we can get it into air seeders, so that we can make it practical for getting into our systems. I've got a picture here of legumes, um, perhaps less discussed in the context of biochar, but I think it needs to be. We've got shifts towards more protein demand within our ag agricultural markets. And we know that incorporating legumes into our production systems brings advantages of nitrogen capture um, and just rotational benefits for the system. So where does biochar fit with that? Well, a lot of our legumes are dependent on uh, effective rhizobia um, symbiosis. Yet some of our soils here in South Australia are a pretty harsh environment um, for those inoculum. They're acidic or they're dry, sandy soils that challenge the survival of any bug. Um, so if we think about the, the aspects of biochar, it's a particle. Microbes like to attach themselves to the surface and they confer various protective um, properties through the way that they aggregate together. If you think then about the rhizobia industry, the primary carrier is peat. Peat's a non-renewable resource. The EU is shifting towards looking to ban it in terms of an inoculum carrier. So we need to look at alternatives there. Is biochar a good carrier that's more sustainable than peat? You might have noticed that I'm Scottish. The only thing that a good peat should be used for is a good whiskey. Maybe not sustainable, and even the whiskey industry is looking at what are the alternatives so that we can protect our peat resources going forward. Cows, not just cows, but livestock. Biochar has had a lot of work done on how we can integrate it with our livestock system. Being used as a feed additive, it changes the gut microbiome. Um, there is potential um, to reduce methane emissions. But as Rebecca indicated, there needs to be more work. So why aren't our government programs targeting this as a potential, perhaps in combination with some of our seaweed additives? Currently, um, the data that's available would indicate that biochar is nowhere near as effective as the seaweed additives. But would there be a combination effect that we need to think about? Um, there's a great example, of course, out west in Australia um, of integrating biochar as a feed additive, additive um, with livestock, but then using a dung beetle to get that material into the soil, deep into the soil, where it works. Um, and I think, you know, that's a really good example of paying attention to the ecology of the system, not attributing all the benefits to biochar itself, but having an integrated systems view that works with the ecology um, of, the, of the system. I also previously worked with a, um, a company out in New South Wales that was developing green chickens. That's what they called the project. And it stuck with um, a good few, in a good few minds. The idea there was that feeding biochar to chickens could bring benefits to the chicken productivity, the gut health, um, and the compost that goes out the system. And what that, um, that, uh, what that demonstrated was a really circular approach of the company that was driving those, those changes or those opportunities within the system. They also, as well as their feed side, produced um, compost but they had trouble at times getting the chicken compost at a time when they needed it. 
So they actually established a collaborative relationship with the chicken industry so that they'd produce the feed that had the biochar in it and they would then get the chicken uh, litter back in return. One of the really interesting aspects there is it's really difficult to get biochar into chicken feed. The chicken feed is so closely balanced in terms of its um, nitrogen and protein content that even asking the producers to get 1% biochar into that feed threw them into a spin because it disbalances their calculations around protein. However, we did it and we got faster um, chicken production, more egg growth, uh, sorry, egg growth, um, more egg laying and longer laying times of those chickens. So there's again multiple benefits coming from the integrated system approach. A couple more highlights. Um, I think um, South Australia has a strong horticulture industry and protected cropping systems. And again, this offers a um, uh, opportunity to tie in energy use with biochar production. Horticulture, um, I think horticulture, both um, soft fruits, citrus um, and um, soft fruits and also the nut industry offer a very interesting potential um, for pyrolysis biochar systems. These sources are not just sources of feedstock for um, pyrolysis and biochar, but they contain the valuable bioactives that might really tip that economic platform towards establishing um, pyrolysis plants that make um, best use of the value that can be bring, brought. There's one really good example over in the sugar industry um, out east, and that's actually interesting because these bioactives that you can extract from sugarcane wastes have a high value for the pharmaceutical industry and they actually treat diabetes. So you have production of sugar and the natural um, solution sitting side by side. So to come back to what pyrolysis biochar systems means today, I think we need to get out of this view that we put biochar into soil in this simple viewpoint. It really is um, a multi-system integrated approach it starts with place-based understanding of what are the biomasses available, how they are distributed, and where they're concentrated enough to give us that feedstock to supply um, the, the um, pyrolysis plant. We also then need to be thinking about what value do those bioresources have? Do they have additional value as bioactives or industrial chemicals? that can be brought um, out prior to pyrolysis. There's a whole bunch of thermal technologies that are then for consideration that are better suited to dry biomasses, wet biomasses, whatever they might be. Um, and hopefully we'll have um, a little bit more outline on some of those technologies later today. Second place-based aspect is really how are we going to apply that? And what are both the environmental and agronomic applications for carbon enhanced um, products that we can uh, use to improve our environmental footprints. And a tip towards socioeconomic benefits, there is real um, opportunity to diversify our system, to build net zero regions, um, and to market the sustainable low footprint aspect of various South Australian products. This journey, of course, is not um, our, our transition to sustainable low carbon futures is not an individual sector sprint. It's a collaborative regional journey that must consider um, plural values. It's got to consider what we want out of a region as a whole through interconnecting um, our industries. So just to emphasize, um, Pyrolysis biochar opportunities lie in an integrated system approach where we're combining organic resources, bioenergy, carbon enhanced products, and perhaps even high value bioactives. 
And just to finish today, um, I would like to acknowledge fire. We are stood here on Ghana country and the indigenous peoples, not just of Australia, but all around the world have a close tie with fire and how we integrate that into land management. Now, that might be quite different from, um, from an approach to the technologies that we're talking about today. But I think there's an awful lot that we can learn from that interconnected aspect of our indigenous populations. And today, this morning at our opening, that was highlighted with our rocks on the ground and how country is central, but we might need multiple components to deliver the overall. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, we do have a 15-minute session at the end of the um, three um, next couple of presentations to ask questions, but I will take one point of clarification if anyone has a clarification point, otherwise we'll save our questions for that 15 minutes. No, I think we'll keep moving to, to keep um, the program on track then. Uh, so I would now like to welcome Dr. Eshan Tavakoli, who is also based at the Wake campus here. Dr. Eshan is a senior Mortlake fellow at the University of Adelaide, specialising in soil plant interactions, nanogeochemistry and soil-based constraints to grain crops in farming systems. And I know his presentation is of great interest to a number of cereal producers that are here with us today. Yashan's got 15 years of research and development experience and leads a research program here at the School of Soil Science um, within the School of Agriculture, Food and Wine. Um, now, I think that we could potentially run a whole day on biochar and its application to soil, um, but we had to pick off um, what we, you know, some of the newest research, and I'm really excited to hear from Eshan. So, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Melissa, and good afternoon. It's a great opportunity to be here, and I really appreciate um, the invitation to give this presentation today. After that amazing Scottish accent of Lynn, um, it's going to be difficult for me to keep you entertained here, so my apologies. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is some of the recent um, research that we have completed in the space of developing innovative novel amendments. And specifically, I'm going to talk about three categories or bring an example of how we use biochar to come up with those novel formulations for three areas. Um, amendment to improve poorly structured soils, and this is probably by far the largest area of our research investment, followed by an example of how we can improve phosphorus nutrition in high fixing soils, and also using biochar as a technology for improving carbon stabilization, and this will be capitalized on um, the excellent presentation that Annette gave this morning. Uh, I don't have a, a name of myself in this first um, um, slide for a good reason. This work that I'm going to talk about has received um, great contribution from leading scientists across the country, which I'm acknowledging them here, and also connected to the, to the work that I've completed um, at the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and mainly funded by GRDC, Seoul CRC, and also um, uh, the University of Adelaide now um, on a different scale. So I really acknowledge, and uh, some of the co-authors of these presentations are in this, um, in this room today. Um, first of all, I just want to talk about the scale of the problem. More than 75% of our souls in Australia are suffering from one or more than one problem. Um, these sort of issues are basically, I categorize them in three areas, soil structural decline, so, uh, and this is refer referred to um, sodicity. Having said that, sodicity is not the only issue. We've got uh, slaking issues in many of our farming system, which is due to the lack of, or lack of organic carbon, keep the soil intact and structured, um, and also chemical issues due to the imbalance of um, cations and anions on the clay content. Um, acidity and specifically subsurface acidity is emerging issue in um, agricultural landscape, and also we've got al also um, salinity related issues. The important point here is that we are losing almost um, about $3 billion in economy every year from broad acre cropping system. 
just to also summarize, uh, to focus here, my presentation is dealing with uh, dry land agriculture and broad acre system um, uh, at today. Um, this um, slide is basically highlighting the a spread of these different issues across the country from the northern to the southern and western part of the country and just shows how, for example, sodicity on the top left-hand side affecting a large area of the land um, in, in our arable land. Um, what is the consequence of this problem? So I came up with this diagram and trying to simplify what we are trying to achieve. Um, we've got a known amount of water in our soil profile, which I refer to this as size of bucket. In an optimal condition, plant has to have access to this, should be able to dry down this profile of water from the upper limit to the lower limit and, trans and convert that um, um, water used to the biomass production. As I explained earlier, in many of the cases, due to the presence of one or more than subsoil constraints, um, there is a reduced bucket of water. Um, that means we, we still have the water in the soil profile, but due to the presence of these soils, either that water is very, very tightly held to the clay content, or due to the chemical constraints associated with acidity, for example, plant root cannot capture the water that is, used, that is uh, available in the subsoil. And whatever we do with soil management um, has this target and uh, mission make this water more available or open up that um, extra bucket of the si uh, size of the bucket. Um, in terms of um, examples that I'm going to talk about today, um, let's just start with poorly structured soils because in my opinion, soil structure is one of the most limiting factors in crop productivity in Australia. And there are two phenomena that are responsible for this um, um, productivity measures. A slaking of the soil particles, which is characterized by the lack of organic carbon. And if you look at the Petri dish on the left-hand side, you will see that the collapse of aggregate when it is hydrated. And I can tell you that probably 80% of our subsoils from, the, from anywhere from Queensland down to South Australia, followed by the clay soils in Western Australia, has um, these issues in common. On the right-hand side of that Petri dish, you can look at the dispersion. This is the imbalance of the cations, which is um, too much sodium on the exchangeable site of the clay as opposed to calcium, which will keep that aggregates intact. And most of our soils having these two problems at the same times. And therefore, um, we have creation of hard setting soils, or we have a very dense clay subsoil um, that is not really um, a pleasant environment for roots to grow. So um, the challenge here is what to do with it. There are before, before we look at the options for management, let's see what happens to uh, crop production in some of these, um, some of these environments. So uh, this is a photo taken in 2021 um, in southern New South Wales, amazing canola crop. A few weeks later, um, that canola crop was nothing. And again, the, um, the, the heart of the problem for that crop to move from hero to zero is related to um, the, the problems that are hidden below that soil surface, that really heavy texture clay um, uh, could not accommodate the rainfall that happened in that area, and therefore we get transient water logging, and um, the hard setting um, soil conditions um, resulted in the lack of root growth and, um, a uh, and subsequently crop um, um, failure. There are tra traditional approaches, uh, the farm, the Industry common practice um, has always been gypsum application in some of these soils, and surface application of gypsum by far has been um, the, the most adopted um, industry practice by farmers. Um, calcium replaces sodium, and also there is an also a reduction in extreme soil pH because many of these um, poorly structured soils has um, extreme alkalinity. The problem with gypsum is that it often requires high rate of application, and it only uh, improve the area of um, where you place your gypsum. Gypsum is pretty much insoluble in water, and it doesn't move in the soil profile. So you still have quite a few issues that are hidden below the surface, and that traditional approach cannot look after it. In, in recent years, um, and mainly with um, co-investment from GRDC, we looked at um, different approaches that um, included application of organic amendment 
or organic amendment um, embedded into a mineral phase, and we looked at developing new machineries that we can inject some of these amendments into the subsoil. Um, again, while we have seen some remarkable success with these approaches, still you need to have a high rate of applications and not all of the soils being responding to these sort of treatments. And therefore, I um, started to develop a research concentrations on developing new and advanced material in agriculture. And um, thanks to Professor Steven Joseph, who has been an amazing mentor over the last five, seven years, opened up my eye to the possibility that we could use biochar as a career for the elements of interest that we need to deliver into the soil. Uh, the example that you see on the right-hand side is a machinery that we developed in DPI, um, New South Wales DPI, and simultaneously, if we want, we can um, incorporate organic matter, a pH or lime, and also liquid fertilizer into the subsoil to a depth of roughly 40 centimeters. Um, so, let's talk about biochar. Um, I've also used pyrogenic carbon as a replacement as, uh, of the word biochar because uh, some of my work um, uses other type of carbon that is not biochar, but it has a very similar property. So biochar and pyrogenic carbon today is, has exactly the same definition. One of the really important uh, properties that biochar has, and Melissa talked about surface area, the other, uh, and, and that high surface area provide a huge opportunity for biochar to accept electron and also donate electron. And that capacity has a very important consequence in our soil environment. Um, most of the research in agronomy, um, whenever we talk about soil management, talk about pH, and I want to introduce another important pr property today, which is EH, or redox potential of the soil. And redox reactions, which are reductive oxidation reactions in the soils, are responsible for uh, solubility, bioavailability, and speciations of many elements, including carbon, phosphorus, and nitrogen. And many of our soils in dryland agricultures are redox poor, and we could use the property of biochar to load it with different elements, um, and specifically I will talk about iron minerals today, to convert that biochar on the left-hand side, which is not really redox active, to a new product on the right-hand side, which is redox active, and, um, and try to use that benefits for improving different purposes in, in our um, agricultural soil. Um, one of the um, greatest colleagues that I've always had is Professor Lucas Van Zuyten, based at Wollingborg Ag Institute, and the formulation de design always starts over an amazing coffee or two. Um, based on those concepts, we, we have a small scale biochar production with different mineral phase, which I will explain later. And one important um, part of our research is to characterize the um, the, the products for its properties and a number of physical chemical properties from the microscopy to that speciations of chemical functions on the biochar is really important to understand what is actually the mode of action of the product that we created and we are going to deploy in our soil environment. After that um, a small scale experiment, we always have, uh, so that, that probably lead into the production of 10 or 15 products which we cannot um, go into the field or into extensive glasshouse experiments. So we have benched up a smaller scale experiment to um, have a um, shotgun approach to see which one is working and which not is not working. And the example I'm giving today are a couple of uh, gypsum formulations that we um, collaborated with um, Mr. John Sad, who is in this room as well, and, um, and further used it in different uh, trials. So based on biochar and iron mineralogy, we came up with a product that contained uh, different phases, and we, when you put it under a scanning electron microscope, this is how it looked like. So you can see that um, when you do the chemical analysis on the particle, and by the way, the size of particle is also important, um, we often try to focus on the nano or submicron structure of biochar because as you achieve that the smaller particle size, you um, improve the uh, surface area and electron donation accepting capacity of the of the biochar. In this case, we've got a biochar with, um, that is made from oat and hay, and all the pore structure of the biochar is filled with gyps nano gypsum and also with iron minerals. And, uh, and there is a very good rationale scientifically on how this product will improve a structural soil stability. Um, if I just want to quickly demonstrate what happens to your structural stability of the soil, in a response to this product from left to the right hand side, uh, this is a sodic um, alkaline salts from southern New South Wales. 
that we can um, show in response to um, this formulation, uh, we actually improve the structural stability and corrected that dispersive slaking behavior of the, part uh, of the soil after, um, after incubation with the product. Um, the next step usually is um, with the shortlisted product, we go to um, glasshouse experiment, but there is very, um, an, an important component of our glasshouse glass experiment is that we use intact soil cores. Um, any experiment in um, improving soil structure has to, um, has to be able to demonstrate the mode of action and efficacy of these products in soils that have a similar a structural stability in the field. So we use intact soil cores from the field and we um, investigate the, mo um, the agronomic efficacy of our products. And on the right hand side, that system basically measures the changes in soil redox properties over time using a data logger system. Um, quickly, if I just want to show some of the um, um, agronomic um, measurements from these small scale experiments, in response to some of these um, um, novel and innovative products, um, basically carbon coated gypsum, I call them, and submicron sized gypsum dispersion, we can see a huge improvement both in biomass and also in grain yield from the glasshouse based experiment um, compared to conventional source of gypsum that farmer has been using. Um, in terms of um, some of the physiological parameters that we have seen, a simple measurement of the chlorophyll content of the plant, and in my opinion, greenness in a, uh, in a crop physiological growth indicate tolerance, shows that these novel products are able to extend the life of the plant when, um, when that control treatment, which is the uh, closed circle of, um, of lines over 110 days of plant growth, uh, reach maturity and senescence, we have a still and physiologically active crop in this system treated with um, these novel based amendments and that has a huge amount of consequences in terms of if, if we can replicate that in the field, um, what happens to a crop that is physiologically active, still um, photosynthesized, and what happens to delaying its maturity when it comes to abiotic um, heat or uh, drought stresses. Um, and this is an, an, an area that we are still investigating for understanding the mechanisms further. Um, in terms of photosynthesis, which is the primary determinant of crop yield, we can demonstrate the crops that are being grown in these, um, in these um, soil treated with um, novel amendments, demonstrate a significantly improved photosynthetic capacity, which is really important because that shows how the crop can have access to the soil water and keep using it as opposed to uh, the soil that is not treated or treated with the conventional agricultural gypsum. Um, so we were fortunate to secure further funding from Soil CRC and, um, and work with our industry partners to develop some of, um, scale up some of these um, proof of concept products. Um, um, this is supposed to be a video, which I'm not sure if it's gonna work or not. not can you just, um, if you, press in, in the, yeah. So this is just an example of how we scale up some of those products for a subsequent um, field experiment in southern New South Wales. Uh, we made a mess, absolutely made a big mess, uh, but the end results were quite successful. So what you see here is an iron and a doped biochar, which is basically use um, oat and hay um, as the source of feedstock and and this is the end of that production um, platform when th these are being um, pelletized. The problem with this product here is the pelletization at the moment. And this is um, an active and important component of our research to come up with a new technology for improvement of the pelletizations of the products. Um, having said that, um, we, as I said, we did go to the field and this is the results that recently um, we, um, we obtained from the second year of this experiment in Lockhart, which is um, a broad acre cropping area in southern New South Wales. And compared to control or conventional approaches, we can demonstrate there is up to 18% improvement in crop yield when we, um, when we treat that soil with, con uh, with, with these, some of these novel products. And this is the second year. In the first year of the experiment, we didn't see any significant results, but um, from the chemical and physical interaction of the amendment with the soil environment. The, the, in, at the field level, there is always um, a, a time before that reactions improve soil conditions and when the crop can see those benefits. 
Um, so that was um, quite an encouraging, and this is an ongoing project until 2028. So um, another important problem in Australia is phosphorus and phosphorus use efficiency. And in this um, land in South Australia, probably we have the, um, one of the largest issues of PU's efficiency in calcarosols, which uh, South Australia is very well known for it. The reason for it is that um, we have a huge amount of calcium carbonate, which um, any type of conventional phosphorus fertilizer application result in huge amount of fixations on the surface of calcium carbonate. And therefore, most of our farming systems um, are working with a phosphorus use efficiency of 25 to 30 percent. Based on that redox science and how we could probably activate the redox property of a new novel fertilizer, we came up with the proof of concept for formulation. And, <coughs> and that we, <coughs> that we um, deployed in um, a GRDC and Seoul CRC exper co-funded experiment, which looked at the efficacy of these products um, in Air Peninsula of South Australia. So the results that I'm showing is just one year of the results, but this project has gone for three or four years, I think. And there is a consistent um, um, performance of these products with a residual effect. So this is just a demonstration that how, again, we scaled up and pelletized these products. This time, a lot more successful in terms of the pelletization. Uh, but it's a carbon, uh, iron phosphorus composite that we came up and the results at the field level demonstrate that we, we are able now to add perform any other conventional products in terms of phosphorus nutrition um, in this part of the world. So at least two sites, Port Guinea and Puchera, has shown significant and dramatic improvements. And for your reference, the farmer told me that was the best crop that he's seen since 1987 and I was five years old at that time. So. Uh, in collaboration with Professor Enzo Lombi, one of my colleagues at UniSA, we, want, uh, we, we were interested to look at what happens actually to phosphorus dynamics. So Enzo and his team developed a DGT technique, and DGT, which is a stand for um, diffusion, in gra uh, in diffusion gradients in thin films, uh, is picking up the phosphorus um, available for the crop. So that means if you expose the soil with the phosphorus content, DGT is able to um, only pick up this bioavailable part of the phosphorus. Enzo's group developed DGT gels that you can deploy into the field. So these results um, at, the, at the bottom of this page are those DGT gels uh, being imaged by laser ablation. And what you can see on the right hand side, which is our formulation, the density of the color shows the more phosphorus availability of the phosphorus. So um, it's comparing our formulation for phosphorus composite made from the biochar uh, compared to MAP on the left-hand side. And clearly, during the crop season, we can demonstrate here is that we may, we have significantly more available phosphorus release from this product as opposed to conventional sources, which I think um, in the future and its commercialization hopefully will revolutionize the way that we've been farming in these soils from the phosphorus point of view. Sure. Um, and now, the last example, that's very much appreciated, thank you. The last um, part of my talk is talking about biochar as a, as a material that <coughs> could enhance soil, uh, soil carbon stabilization. Annette um, discussed um, some of these studies that we co-authored with Lynn and Annette and our amazing student at the time, who's now successfully brought him to the University of Adelaide. About 60% of carbon input into agricultural soil is coming from plant input, or what we call a rhizodeposits. So um, if you don't do anything with that rhizodeposit, it will be consumed by microbial activity. Huge amount of that will be um, emitted back to the atmosphere in terms of CO2. And we heard this morning um, transport and agriculture are the two main sources of emission in South Australia, at least. For the first time um, um, in, in this study, we demonstrated that we could use biochar as a new technology that stabilized a component of that rosa deposits and protect it from microbial degradation. We published some influential research papers um, from that, from those studies. And can you just play? Um, that's on the right hand side. That's also a movie. And that, um, and that little animation shows how carbon is being protected in the middle of a mineral phase which is characterized by aluminum and iron. 
Okay, so fundamental study from a, a long-term field experiment in northern New South Wales, and there are two important um, lessons from here. First of all, um, these soils are really rich in iron, and addition of biochar improved the sealing capacity of the soil to, um, um, to capture that rise of deposit. I thought, okay, this is amazing, we published this, but can we use that technology, reverse engineer um, some of our soils, and come up with some composites that has biochar and iron in it and use that as a new material for improving carbon content of our soils. Um, some of our studies um, showed also in Calcutta soils here that um, we are able to improve carbon use efficiency of, uh, of, of carbon inputs in the soil and the presence of iron significantly, iron mineral in significantly improves the carbon use efficiency even though uh, there are not very um, large differences on the right-hand side between two graphs, but mathematically that's 65% improvement in carbon use efficiency when you have an iron into the, into the mix. So that um, led into the new project and we ended up um, developing a concept for doping a biochar with nano-structured um, iron, specifically ferrihydrite, uh, there are so many different types of iron mineral. Um, I'm referring to short range order iron minerals. And uh, some of the data that we can see, these are early um, data that literally just um, this graph um, came yesterday, demonstrating the fact that we are able with this technology to um, reduce the CO2 emission by about 48% when we have iron and biochar in the system. Why is it happening? Uh, it comes back to the concept of um, biochar as a um, geo battery, and if you remember, I talked about electron accepting and donating. In the agricultural soils, transformation of iron mineral is very slow. And uh, by the way, um, just the discovery of how iron mineral improves carbon stabilization has been one of the breakthrough uh, in the last century. But we are always looking for. Um, a catalyst here to improve that transformation because if we cannot transform iron minerals in the soil, we cannot activate carbon stabilization. So we went to a, uh, quite a complex deal of research um, funded by Australian Synchrotron which allows us to understand how carbon behaves and how iron behaves to characterize the system and the speciation of iron and carbon. And we really, um, we are excited to see from our studies that um, at the presence of biochar, we can demonstrate that there is a um, significant transformation of iron in the soil compared to when we don't have it in the soils. And, and, and this is giving us some um, mechanistic understanding of why iron composite with biochar behaves so amazingly in reducing the CO2 emission. And, and that relates to the fact that when you add biochar, it really quickly um, improves the iron transformation and contribute to iron and to carbon stabilization in, this, in the system. So I've got a conclusion just only for the last part of this talk, which talk about enhancing carbon stabilization through the application of the biochar and iron. And this is um, an area of the work that I think there are transformative um, opportunities that we could improve um, carbon dioxide emission from our agricultural industry by the introduction of these novel products. Thank you. Ishan, that was really insightful and I'm sure, uh, especially for our um, cereal producers in the room, and I'm sure they've got many questions and I think um, it really paves the way for those that are also um, producing biochar and the types of biochar that, that could be produced and put out there in the marketplace. Um, so we, just reminding that we do have the 15 minutes of discussion at the end, so just a point, any, any quick point of clarification. Um, so thank you, Annette. Really quick one, sorry if I missed it. Um, what sort of rates were you applying to see those improvements in the soil structural properties when you were using the gypsum? Um, sure, um, gypsum? And, and that's very interesting. That was at the rate of 500 kilogram per hectare. Um, I think like, there's, there's lots of questions and I think we'll open up for discussion. I've got lots of questions too, Eshan. So um, we'll put our hands together for uh, for Eshan as well. I'm sure if no one else can think of some, I've got plenty of questions. 
Um, I would now like to introduce Dr Jacqueline Bolston, um, who is um, the Director of Sustainability at IPWIA, which is the Institute of Municipal Engineering Australia. And um, Jackie's doing some great work there and is going to talk about the use of, sorry, Institute of Public Works Engineering Australasia. Um, and she's going to talk about the use of biochar and infrastructure assets. Um, and so it's a really good pathway and in segue into the presentations after lunch as well, which is about biochar and infrastructure. Um, I've known Jackie for a number of years, a long time. I worked um, and actually um, took over one of Jackie's jobs while she went into state and did her PhD. Uh, she was an applied research scientist at, at SARI, um, but she has been an applied climate scientist for the last 25 years and has been researching the impacts of climate variability and climate change for agriculture and natural resources and ecosystems and in the built environment. Um, and she has worked as the director of her own company, Jacqueline Bolston and Associates, um, as a C, um, in the same space and has worked all over Australia in uh, various applications of, of climate variability and change. Um, but I'm really excited to hear about Jackie's work and her thoughts on how biochar can apply to the built environment. And um, she's a really important stakeholder in this space to um, drive this forward with her connections through IPWIA. So thank you, Jackie, for your time and welcome. Thank you. Now, how do I go down? I just press the down on the down arrow. No, wrong. Right. Okay. So, uh, a big thank you to um, ANSB for inviting me to present today on behalf of IPWEA. I'm using my Director of Sustainability hat for IPWEA. Um, it's fantastic to see so many people in the room interested in biochar and its multiple uses. And so I'm going to talk today about infrastructure and, and the opportunities for biochar in that space because I think they're enormous, uh, perhaps even bigger than in the agricultural area. So I'll just outline briefly what IPWEA is, who we are, what we do, uh, infrastructure and why it matters what solutions there are, uh, climate resilient assets, the circular economy, natural and green infrastructure options. I'll then talk a little deeper about coal ash and infrastructure assets and how it's used, and biochar and infrastructure assets uh, as a similar product. And then perhaps finally discuss a little bit about the challenges and use of biochar in infrastructure assets and how we overcome those. So the Institute of Public Works and Engineering uh, is the peak association for public works professionals across Australia and New Zealand, and our resources are used by the World Bank when investing in infrastructure options. We provide comprehensive educational programs, technical publications, advocacy on behalf of our members, and the chance to network and collaborate with peers both nationally and internationally through our range of annual conferences. Our core business is to provide education, tools and resources to support all asset intensive organisations manage their infrastructure assets. And we have a community of over 30,000 members in both Australia, New Zealand and overseas. So just to be clear when we're talking about infrastructure, we're meaning physical assets that contribute to meeting the needs of major economic and social facilities and services globally. So they're typically large interconnected networks and include natural, grey, green and blue infrastructure. Within these groupings there's a variety of asset classes. So for example within the grey assets we might see classes including roads, bridges, waterways and wastewater systems and buildings. Uh, within the natural infrastructure assets class, we might see wetlands, parks, coastal defences and so on. And each of these assets has a number of components that are managed separately to take into account their specific physical or functional qualities, including their life expectancy, their maintenance regimes, the risks that come with them and the criticality of the services that they provide. Infrastructure asset management is the systematic process of managing an asset through its entire life cycle, from planning and design through acquisition and deployment, 
operation and maintenance, and finally decommissioning, disposal and recycling. So there are a range of measures that are managed throughout that process that includes, of course, costs of your assets, the risks that they may present, efficiencies, the durability, their safety, their functionality, their sustainability, and a range of other performance attributes. And in most jurisdictions, there are legal and financial requirements that must be met in the management of infrastructure assets. And so as an industry, um, and the use of biochar in the infrastructure sphere, it's important to understand that engineers are legally obliged to, or legally required to meet a range of different standards in the use of products. Why does infrastructure matter? And this is a really big point to understand. It's a crucial player in the path to sustainable future. The World, S the World Bank estimates that infrastructure now accounts for approximately 70% of all global greenhouse gas emissions and half of all the resources used and the waste created every year. Concrete alone is now the most widely used product on earth after water and every year a quantity of concrete large enough to cover the UK is put in place on the planet. So we're talking vast, vast quantities of a product. Add to that the projection that 60 to 70 percent of the 2050 infrastructure has not even yet been built and it becomes obvious that the infrastructure sector has enormous to potential to either enhance or avoid the use of materials and reduce waste and CO2 emissions at the same time, as well as reducing other impacts on the climate as when demands for water and raw materials. So solutions to our unsustainable future are going to have to be multi-pronged. I think we're all aware of that. For the infrastructure sector, that means that we must ensure that all our new infrastructure is both climate resilient and carbon neutral in its construction, its lifespan, its maintenance, its repair, its upgrade, and its recycle. So it has the full gamut of its life cycle needs to be carbon neutral. We also need to ensure that all our existing assets have their longest possible useful life. In other words, they're constructed and maintained to cope with the impacts of climate change going forward, and that they're then repurposed and recycled at the end of their useful life. We can do that by identifying climate change vulnerable assets and the impacts that they would need to withstand, for example, roads in heat waves um, and coastal assets in the face of rising sea level. And we've described that in detail in our practice note 12.1, the climate impacts on infrastructure assets. We also need to build back better any infrastructure that is damaged by climate change to ensure that they are resilient and use the latest technology available. For example, cool road surfacing uh, and other solutions that are covered in our practice note 12.2, climate resilient uh, assets. We also need to embrace a circular economy, which is something we've had uh, mentioned before, to keep our products and their components and materials circulating in the economy at their highest use for as long as possible. And that's something that we've described in detail in our practice note 13, which I'll go into a little more detail. And finally, we need to favour natural and green infrastructure assets over grey assets wherever possible, uh, and including those that contain biochar. So the most commonly used materials in infrastructure are also the most common waste products. In practice note 13, the circular economy and infrastructure assets, we talk about asphalt, coal ash, concrete bricks, rubble, glass, metals, organics, including biochar, plastic, tires, and wood. The practice note describes how each material is produced, recycled, currently available recycled products that you can access on the market, their use within the built environment, including in over 200 common assets, the relevant standards and specifications that those materials have to meet, the current manufacturers that are producing them and sources of further information. 
There's a whole bunch of case studies in there and extensive links so you can uh, easily find further information including the industry organisations and suppliers and links to ANZ being there. So these materials that are ticked in red on this slide have the capacity to be including biochar in their manufacture. For example, furnace feedstock for glass and metals uh, as a material, for example, as an additive to concrete or to provide feedstock from waste, for example, wood. In practice, uh, in practice note 13, we cover coal ash in detail. Um, that is because uh, it's a comparison to biochar, but there are hundreds of millions of tonnes of coal ash generated each year, and it's one of the largest sources of waste globally. The recycling of coal ash has been undertaken for decades, and global recycling rates average 53%, although in Japan the recycling rates are 97% now. The benefits of using coal ash have been demonstrated for a long time to be significant within the infrastructure sector. As an example, the savings in greenhouse gas emissions for coal, fly ash, concrete, compared to Portland cement concrete, can exceed 95% as a result of reduced cement content. So the coal ash acts as a cement substitute within the concrete. And some of its uses and markets may also be applicable to biochar. Already coal ash is used as a Portland cement replacement in concrete manufacturing for structural and non-structural works. Uh, it's used as a binder or SCM for stabilisation, both within pavement layers and subgrade as a precursor, as is uh, a source of alumina and silica in geopolymeric binders for stabilising and geopolymer concretes, in flowable fills such as a low strength control materials, as an additional SCM in foamed bitumen stabilisers. It's used as a filler in asphalt, replacing the natural mineral fillers. It's used in concrete bricks and construction blocks, which are lightweight, uniform in size, they have a high compressive strength, cure at room temperature, so they don't even require firing. So again, we can reduce our CO2 emissions in the use of uh, coal ash to produce concrete bricks. It's a lightweight aggregate and it's also used in plasterboard. So practice note 13 also covers biochar in the sections on organic materials. As biochar is a chemically stable compound, it can lock up its carbon for potentially thousands of years, as we've have heard. It's also a hyper-versatile material with an increasing number of applications in engineering and industry. It can act as an industrial agent to improve the physical and chemical properties of a range of different materials. And research and trials are progressing on its use in soils, concrete, asphalt, natural inorganic clay composites, cement mortar, red clay binders, bituminous materials, geopolymers, industrial paints and resins, for example, bioplastics, building materials, textiles and plastics. So we can see the diversity of it expands widely. When we compare these potential uses for biochar in infrastructure assets, we can see a strong alignment with the ANS big industry roadmap for other non-soil uses uh, and biocarbons. So I've marked here uh, with the red tick those potential uses for biochar within the non-soil uses uh, sector. Uh, it's important to note that in green infrastructure settings, biochar has already been used extensively for landscaping, soil amelioration and amendment, turfing and planting, stormwater filter berms and filter socks, compost blankets and bioretention and for fine sediments, phosphorus, nitrogen, metals and hydrocarbons out of stormwater. I can see um, that from an assets perspective, there might be a number of challenges for biochar industry to overcome. As is the case in the use of all recycled materials in infrastructure assets, engineers will require specific details for the use of biochar in their projects because of their legal responsibilities. 
This may mean that the industry will require additional research on engineering properties of biochar from their different feedstocks and their use in a range of engineering materials and applications. You will need to be able to provide clear material specifications for use by engineers, for example, as defined by ISO standards, which currently exist for the use of solid biofuels and biochar in soils, but not for its use in engineering materials. The European Biochar Certificate Guideline provides a good basis for this work, and I'll touch on that in the next slide. The industry will also have to be able to implement robust accredited sampling and testing methods as required by the engineering processes and certification of companies that process biochar and manufacture biochar based products. And finally, there's probably the need to turn the research that's already been done extensively into policy and practical implementation steps. Uh, many of you might already be aware of the European Biochar Certificate process. Uh, it was developed to provide high quality production and product guidelines and is a good basis for an Australian certification process. These guidelines recognise that each biochar application is different and hence demands specific certification parameters that must be specified, controlled and guaranteed is very much that targeted approach that we talked about before. What is your feedstock? How is your biochar produced? And exactly where can then you use that product? The EBC materials, basic material certification is the basic and most fundamental class. Every biochar and biochar based product in the EU must be labelled according to the EBC certification class under which it is traded. The EBC urban class provides strong standards for the use of biochar in tree planting, park maintenance, sidewalk embellishments, ornamental plantings, rainwater drainage and filtration systems. And the EBC basic materials certification guarantees sustainably produced biochar, which can be used in basic industries such as to produce building materials, road construction, asphalt, electronics, sewage, drains and composite materials. So then there is also a specific industry classes that are currently being developed which are defining biochar qualities for their use in specific construction materials, polymers, textiles and other materials. Uh, and these are going to be developed in response to demand from the individual industries. So finally, to leave you with a case study, which I think is a great demonstration of the potential for biochar within uh, the infrastructure zone. Um, this one comes from Stockholm and it demonstrates the diversity of the use of biochar in just a single project. Here we've got a street tree pit, which includes an asphalt road, a concrete pavement, a rainwater gutter, grates, filters, and structural soil that is comprised of a, name, a number of layers of similar sized stones that are called macadam, and that provide a very stable foundation for both the road and the sidewalk it also include a mixture of biochar and compost that is flushed down into the gaps between the stones so that the tree roots can infiltrate further down. Most of these components can use biochar in their composition, including the concrete, the asphalt, the soil, the filters and the macadam. So again, I've put a red tick there next to each of the potential uses for biochar within this uh, example alone. So thank you for further information about IPWEA or our resources, including Practice Note 13. You can visit our website. It's available through the bookshop. And it is free for all South Australian residents for a short time because it was recently uh, funded by the South Australian government. So if you want your free copy of Practice Note 13, please go to the bookshop and tick the box to say you're South Australian and you'll, you'll get access to it free. IPRIA is supportive of the biochar industry and will continue to include relevant information on biochar to our members as it becomes available and we can update all our resources electronically whenever we're provided with more details. So thank you, Mel.
Thank you, Jackie. That was a fantastic and really well thought out presentation. And Don didn't even have to give you a, a time warning. Um, so we we'll just ask for some uh, questions of clarification from Jackie. But I will also ask for our whole panel, if we've got enough chairs, we do, to come up. You, you, don't, you can just pull your chairs forward if you like. Um, so any points of clarification while we do have this panel discussion? We've got 15 minutes. Because um, I know we've got John Sard also talking about biochar and concrete after lunch as well, and there'll be some more things come up there as well as Dave Simmons, really excited about talking about biochar in highways. Um, but I would like to invite the previous speakers all back up here, um, and if you'd like to grab a seat, and we'll um, coordinate some questions. And while we do that, I'm going to throw Renga under the bus, who has organised this wine. Um, from Tulbrick and he's been on our organising panel. So Renga, would you mind coming up and presenting each of our speakers with a bottle of wine to say thank you because you did organise it and you have done some great work supporting our organising panel. So I'll ask Renga to, to um, give those to us. So, um, so Annette and Lynn, would you mind joining us on the stage and Ishan as well? Thank you. Um, no, we did give Lynn a, a, Annette a bottle of wine. We'll see if she takes a second one. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, it is a bit of a mix uh, because we've got Jackie from the, the built infrastructure as well. Um, but, you know, I think especially from our cereal producers and the like, what questions do you have about applications of biochar? Um, for those that are wanting to use it in the, in the built environment, what questions do you have for our, our panellists? Um, so, Please, just, um, I've got Don here with the, the microphone if you've got a question. Otherwise, I'll kick it off with my own. Yes, we've got Janine down here from, from the Industries, who is also on the campus and is actually... Um, would you please be able to just say your name and title? And, that would, and anyone that does speak, that will help us as well. Thank sure. You. So, Janine Crozer, I'm the Program Lead for Crop and Pasture Improvement at Persasadi. Um, I've got a question for Isan. You, you were saying that you made your pellets from oat and hay. It struck me that oat and hay is not a waste product. Why is it that you chose oat and hay as your starting biochar so, feedstock? Sure, that's a very uh, simple answer, so, we have Thank you very much. Um, look, I agree that the feeder stock is really important for um, the quality and characteristics of the biochar and I'm really interested in cereal stubble because of its porous structure. When you paralyze it, you come with a network of pores that we can play with um, in terms of filling those pores with minerals of interest that we have. So the use of oat and hay a couple of years ago was specifically related to what it was available at the time to satisfy GRDC's request for setting up a field trial on the same year. So we had large quantity of oat and hay available with our industry partner to make biochar out of it. Most of the biochar that um, I've been developing has a cereal feedstock. Um, that could be wheat, barley, um, and also I did a bit of biochar production with Lucas using sugarcane. Um, so necessarily it was an oat and hay, but m most of the work we've done in the past is barley or wheat stubble. Thank you. Thank you. That's um, hopefully answered your question, Janine. And please let us know who you are. Uh, Matt <coughs> Matthew Quinn from SA Composters. A uh, question for Lynn about green chickens. Just wondering what, the, uh, what you think the mechanism for improving the health of the chickens by adding a bit of biochar to their diet? Um, so the, the mechanism um, relates to the gut health. Um, there is published work that demonstrates um, a reduction in some of the pathogens specifically, um, but there's also an interaction with the nitrogen. Um, so some of the other co-benefits that were happening was reduced ammonia um, in the sheds subsequent, uh, subsequently because the chicken litter itself, well, the, the biochar is holding on to that nitrogen um, more strongly. Um, so we think even within the gut, it's interacting with, with um, how digestion and uptake um, is happening. Um, so yeah, I can forward um, some of that work and the key contacts that are out in New South Wales. Um, the project was led by um, the University of 
Southern Queensland. Sorry, I get my different Queensland universities mixed up, but yeah, it's Southern Queensland. It was a challenge to get it in, um, to ensure that the chickens still had their balanced nutrition that they require. Um, but we did achieve the, the 1% um, and there is a, um, a feed, organic feed provider um, who now sells that product too. Um, I just also just wanted to, um, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and Don, do we have questions online? Have we asked people in the online if there's any questions coming through from that? Um, yeah, so um, you're not sure we can go to those as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah, okay. I think Don and I and another bloke ran the first biochar gig in Byron Bay. I don't know how many years ago, but it's a long time ago. Um, Don went down the biochar route and I went down the biomass route. And the question to the audience really is that most of our products come from petrochemicals and plastics and things like that, which are inorganic. Have they looked at um, organic materials such as hemp and bamboo as a first process for making products? I've got a product there made from water and um, nanotechnology and hemp, and that can be made back directly back into biochar. So to me, the actual question of reducing carbon is, is where we get our products from primarily, and biochar is a secondary thing. Uh, what's the thought on that? Yeah, you're referring to tackle? higher order use. Yes. Okay, order, okay. Yes, yeah. Of biomass. Sorry. Yes. Biomass can be turned into biochar very easily. It's at, at the end of its life, it goes back into biochar and back into a product. Whereas if, if your products are coming from petrochemicals and mining industry, they're very high, they're very difficult and they take up a lot of carbon to reprocess. So in terms of reducing greenhouse, we have to look at what our products are made from. Yes. Can they come from the land or they come from mining, basically? Yeah, yeah. so, so um, um, can you, yeah, uh, you be clear so on the yeah, question? So, yeah, thank you. I think, um, yeah, the penny's dropped with me. Sometimes I'm a bit slow. Um, <laughs> but I think, yeah, that, that, that's extending that circular viewpoint um, even further. Um, and I think it's exactly right. These products that come from um, biochar or plant-based um, products ultimately are going to have um, a easier uh, recycling pathway going, going forward. Um, there has been some work also looking at co-pyrolysis um, of mixed resources, um, which might include plastic. Um, or pyrolysis of plastics, but you know, as, as you say, being based on that petrochemical um, base is going to be a, a big challenge um, from that environmental, um, overall environmental viewpoint and life cycle approach. Annette's got comments on life yes, cycle. And Jackie wants sure. to comment on that one as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just that um, we are going to need so much biomass when we move away from fossil fuels to replace all the fossil-based products that we have in society. Um, so. I guess uh, bioenergy is probably at the lowest value uh, and likely to be at the end of life of our bio-based products and they'll be required to replace the products that you're talking about, but also textiles and you know so many things we make out of plastic now. So um, that's why we really need to find ways to produce more biomass. We can't just produce biochar and everything else we're going to need biomass for from waste and residues. Um, and I know the question from Janine was, was an important one about using crop residues, and that is contentious. I, I grew up as an agronomist, so the thought of scraping together the crop residues and using them for biochar kind of horrifies me. We've spent the last several decades trying to convince landowners to keep their stubble, uh, to protect the soil and to add nutrients and all those sorts of things. Um, however, we could imagine sustainable systems where we remove some of the stubble, and retaining maybe two tonnes um, and make biochar and put that back onto the soil. So I, I think that could be a sustainable system and that's going to be one of the potential sources. There's a lot of crops that will produce uh, globally, uh, but we really are going to have to have some purpose-grown biomass uh, in order to displace all our fossil products oh, for oh, now. One, um, one thank one you. Point. We've got just another one comment point. from Jackie uh, on, the, on that one as well, and I think that's a good point, uh, and that is, you know, and I think we're recycling the carbon, but we're making it into a more permanent, long-term, stable carbon that way. 
Um, so, Jackie? Uh, and that? just to remind people that the material that is used most on Earth is concrete. Um, and concrete produces about 8 to 9% of global emissions in the production of the cement. Um, there are now factories that are producing green cement, because they're using hydrogen technologies. Uh, and steel, of course, is the next largest emitter of greenhouse gas, and about 9% of global emissions come from the production of steel, which again is being now produced uh, increasingly using um, carbon neutral processes. Green, green steel production uses hydrogen and a range of other processes. So they, they are really big, they are the really big producers of CO2 within our materials um, that we use. And, and so there are solutions for those that are reducing emissions as well. Thank you. Mark Hill, who's yeah, a farmer. Mark Hill, farmer from Tarle, one of the few farmers in the room. I think there's a few over there I would like to catch up with lunchtime. It concerns <laughs> me going forward, I've used a bit of biochar through Melissa on a trial a couple of years ago on the farm and I must rep I did my soil test before all that. I've been farming for 54 years this year on a 150 year old family farm this year. I'm really concerned if we're going to go forward and take the easy option of making biochar out of uh, prop, you know, things that come off our paddocks. I've increased my productivity in our farm with less rainfall, I reckon, by threefold after 45 years of direct drilling and 50 years of stubble retention. My organic carbon is not massive, but it's around 2.5%. I've got pasture country home that's never been cropped. It's up to about 45 Melissa tells me she's got agricultural country in Adelaide Hills, grazing country, dairy country doing about six. I don't know what, how that equates to some of the high uh, in the world or around the country, but I do know that uh, not far from me, where they've been farming for a similar length of time as me, they cut every acre of their farm every year after they've wrapped it and take the straw off and use it for different things. But I know their organic carbon levels are half of mine, which means they're having to put a lot more nutrients and other whatevers into their soil to keep their crop production up. I do a lot of reading. My son gave me a book for Christmas called Dirt. I don't know how many people in the, red, in the world in here have read the book Dirt. It comes out of America. It's the most fascinating book I've ever read in my life. It goes back to probably two and a half. Uh, no, sorry, can you please just get to my question? The comment, the comment is we're, the comment is bad farming. Yeah. We've, we're, we're slowly stuffing up the yeah. world. And we're trying to feed the world. And they reckon within, oh, within 30, 40 years, we're not going to have enough land left in this world with the way houses are, are spreading which means us farmers in the room and around the world are going to somehow lift our productivity dramatically on potential less rainfall. And I'm really looking forward to biochar helping me personally. But the way we're going, we're running, as farmers are putting it under more and more pressure to produce more on less soil because we, we keep on clearing the jolly stuff around the world. So my com comment is, don't, if we're going to go down the biochar track, I love it, but please don't buddy grab the stuff that we're producing easily to put through your, your, your factories. Okay, good point. Thank you, Mark. Um, I think, you know, the, um, and that's, you know, that is part of our industry, and I'll just comment on that, and we might see if there's any other comments as well, is that it's sustainable, renewable biomass, and yes, if you're already using it for good purposes on farm, then it makes sense. But I know in cereal cropping, it is more difficult to build your soil carbon, and biochar is carbon. So, um, did you, any of the panel want to comment on that? I talked already about um, the potential to, remo to remove some of it for biochar and put it back onto the soil. So I think we're all hoping yeah. that using biochar in our agricultural systems will enhance the productivity through the mechanisms that we've described. But I guess it's yet to be demonstrated how much you can take away and still maintain productivity. Yeah, I guess um, comment there. I think your, your stubble returns are crucially important um, to the nutrient cycling and the biological activities in those soils. I think we, our discussions around soil carbon are perhaps too focused on the stock and don't value the, the flow of carbon through the system because um, your stubbles are actually um, supplying that flow of carbon and nutrients through the system, which is different to what any replacement through biochar would do anyway. So, you know, to me, good practice is retaining those stubbles and getting them flowing through the system and that the biochar um, 
feedstocks should be coming from elsewhere unless there's a surplus, um, which isn't going to be year on year. You know, then you, you run into challenges of some years having a, a very big stubble load that's difficult um, to, to manage. Um, but on an annual basis, to think about it as a resource for a feedstock, no, I don't think so. I think you're spot on. Um, just another comment for me as well. I think, you know, it's about, it's not all about making biochar from your own biomass as well. So we've got, you know, those that are making biochar from the likes of grape bark or almond hulls or um, wood waste from forestry, and they can't find a home for that. We, you know, we need to um, get takeoff agreements and uses. So there's, you don't necessarily need to use that stubble from your own farm to put biochar on. It's available elsewhere as well. Did you want to comment on that? Okay, are there Question here. So where yeah, are you from? Uh, What's uh, your name? Joe Marks, uh, postdoc, Adelaide Uni, um, working on biochar uh, amendments in, in almond orchards. These guys, um, question for, for Lynn or anyone really. Um, we talk about the, the importance of, of, of specific, specificity with regard to the sort of intrinsic and extrinsic variables that you've got in your system. Um, soil type, uh, feedstock, pyrolysis temperature, etc. Um, I guess for landholders, are there any what kind of resources are out there to, um, for them to easily marry those important variables to achieve the outcome that they require? Um, and, and what are the most important variables you think uh, to, to place a weight on uh, in terms of soil type, uh, soil characteristics, end product, uh, feedstock, and, and you know, how might those combinations come together for that sort of perfect synergy within that specific system? So yeah, I think starting with an understanding of what's um, what's perhaps constraining plant productivity. Um, you know, to me, we're in South Australia, where, which is typically a water limited environment. Um, in the almond orchards, there's um, irrigation, um, but it needs to be getting down through the structure of that soil um, in, into the system. Um, I think, you know, if we take the case of an almond or orchard, you know what your plant is demanding from the soil. You're, you're judging um, to an extent um, what you're feeding the system because of what the plant demands and knowledge of, of what, is, um, what is needed. You know what's being removed. You can estimate um, the nutritional components that are being removed. Um, and in all likelihood, some of those elements which are demanded by the plant are actually locked up in the shells and the prunings and all the rest of it. So to understand what is the nutrient content of that resulting charcoal um, or biochar um, and how that meets the demands of the system, um, whether or not water holding capacity can be improved, where it needs to be in, in the system. So rather than looking for a step-by-step -step sort of process, I think it's more the, the principles of management and um, principles of addressing um, those um, constraints within the system. I think if you go out there thinking, well, this is my constraint, what type of biochar do I need? Um, I think you're almost going down a rabbit hole because you need to know what's available um, and then you know, match that to what is needed. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Are making me feel guilty? Um, we've been talking for ages about the fact that landholders need some guidance on how to choose biochars for their, for their soil. And um, Stephen Joseph has drafted something and he's been on at me and Lucas to read it for months and we haven't quite got around to it. But um, he's trying to write the sort of guidelines that you're talking about. So it might be dreaming, Lynn, to come up with something that is going to be a useful recipe, but that's at least what Joe is trying to do. Uh, yes. Um, Sean, would you like to comment on that one? Or are you? No, I think it's okay. Um, I, and, I, you know, I know leading farmers test their soil for their subsoil constraints, and, and then they find fertilisers and the like that um, overcome those constraints. And, um, and I think, you know, researchers like Ishan um, understand where those constraints are and try to come up with fit-for-purpose solutions. So um, we just need to try to accelerate that as an industry and work out the best way to do that the fastest that we can. And, um, you know, we're working on it, like, the things like um, Stephen's manual. Do we have, you want to, any other questions online? I know we're encroaching into lunch. Um, Don, do you want to read yep. them out? Um, Annette, 
have you seen any figures on what the total impact of biochar and co-benefits might be for Australia? And is there an interest in increasing NDC ambitions by including pyrolysis slash biochar? Um, I'll get it wrong <coughs> if I try to remember what's in the roadmap, but you guys in Ansbig have done some calculations at a national level. Uh, we did some calculations for New South Wales and concluded that biochar mitigation could reduce current New South Wales emissions by nearly 5%, and that's combining the carbon stabilisation and fossil fuel displacement and reduction in nitrous oxide. So significant, but not going to solve the whole problem. No, no others online. Okay, oh, yeah, right. so, um, all right. Well, our panel is around all day for other questions. And, um, you know, Jackie kicked off the, the, the session for this afternoon. And, and I'm sure you'll probably get approached by some farmers in the break as well. So, uh, really round of great presentations. Just a couple of um, other closing thoughts from me is, um, uh, Lynn, Lynn mentioned about biochar and animal feed and talking with Joey, we do know the mechanism in animals, the redox active process uh, is important, but what we do understand is that the biochar itself will affect um, the hydrogen component of methane production in a rumen and so it actually inhibits hydrogen production and that's a new thing yeah, and it's really, good, it's really important to understand that because it's very different to the mechanisms where, of seaweed and other polymers in, in the rumen. And so um, we can, we're, we're talking about in that farmer's manual making fit for purpose chars for animal feed for methane reduction and, uh, and weight gain. Um, anyway, thank you very, very much, panel, for your time and effort and presentations. It's really valued. And we'll go and have a break now for lunch and see you back here at uh, 1.15. And thank you again to our speakers.